So the term rare earth elements, it refers to 17 chemically similar elements within the lanthanide series. So if you can picture the periodic table, it's that bar at the bottom, <laughs> elements 57 to 71, plus scandium and yttrium. Uh, rare earth elements are not actually rare. Uh, they've held on to that name since the late 1700s. Uh, they're used in all manner of electronics, technologies, and high-performance alloys. Uh, they're often described as the vitamins or the spice of industry because they have, over the past several decades, uh, they've enabled through advances in material science our technologies to get smaller and faster and stronger and uh, more resilient. Rare earths are used in just about every technological application you can think of. So if you uh, picture your cell phone or medical technology or military technology or energy generation technology or petroleum refining, uh, rare earth elements likely have a role in those technologies. Whether it's present simply as a, a doping agent um, to make a magnet stronger or a metal alloy uh, even more resilient, or in some cases they might act as signal amplifiers. Right, so an example here might be the element cerium. So just this one element has so many different applications that I think illustrates the diversity of applications for all 17 rare earth elements. So cerium, if you picture perhaps in your grandparents' house, there might be decorative pink glassware. There are the rose colored glasses that some people like to wear. That pigment is imparted by cerium. Cerium also acts as a signal amplifier in transoceanic fiber optic cables. So every 30 kilometers or so in a fiber optic cable, there's a little bit of cerium and that speeds up the signal. So it, it enables uh, international and global internet communications. That very same red pigment and sig signal amplifying property uh, makes cerium a very important element that's used in lasers, lasers that are used for everything from surgical applications to guidance sy systems for missiles and smart bombs. So there's a big difference between a geological deposit that contains a lot of different rare earth elements underground and the end uses that we see ubiquitous in our technologies and infrastructures all around us. And a lot of that comes down to the challenges of separating and processing and refining these elements. Now, because the term rare earth elements refers to 17 chemically similar elements that are one right next to the other on the periodic table, that means they're actually very difficult to break apart, to separate, uh, so that you can have a higher concentration, pure form of praseodymium or neodymium, for example, which are two elements that are used in high powered magnets that are used in everything from maglev trains to wind turbines to missiles. So it's really because of the challenges, the heavy energy and uh, resource and pollution risks that are associated with refining rare earth elements that production has concentrated historically in so few places. Rare earth elements are not rare. They're actually relatively common in the earth's crust, but places that have the energy and the regulatory framework that is amenable to lower cost processing and refining, which is to say uh, with greater social and environmental risk, those um, in the latter part of the 20th century became fewer and farther between. And that's why uh, over the latter part of the 20th century and into the early part of the 21st century, production left the West um, and concentrated in China. Over the past decade, there have been extensive concerted efforts to uh, resume rare earth mining and processing in the US, in Canada, Australia, and many other places besides. It has proven challenging, right? Uh, not least because uh, rare earth mining and processing or rare earth processing is uh, energy intensive, environmentally intensive, and when you're trying to resume an industrial process in a place that hasn't had it for 20 or 30 years, there's a lot of catch up that needs to happen, right? A lot of the expertise for refining and processing uh, is currently in China. And that makes sense because most of the value added processing has been happening in China for the past few decades.
because rare earth elements are not rare, but they have this name, rare, right? It it imbue it gives them this sense of mystique or mystery that makes you think the or make the obvious assumption that they are in fact scarce, when in fact they are not. And one of the reasons why it's been so challenging to diversify global supply chains over the past 15 years, one of the reasons why it's been so challenging for um, companies in the US and Australia and even Canada to uh, get rare earth production and processing up and running is because actually the global supply has been pretty steady. That, um, that when a new uh, deposit is announced or a new mine is about to come online, it actually has the effect often of depressing global prices, which makes it uneconomical to develop further deposits. And so there's two kind of parallel things happening here. There's the market reality, which with a few exceptions is kind of humming along with a steady, reliable supply globally. But then you have the geopolitical dimension, uh, which is characterized more of like a scramble for these things that are called rare, when in fact they are not. 